Hello. Right, this is part two of apple grafting and you join us in the orchard. Uh, excuse the background noise, the flutes are all around us and uh, wanting a bit of attention. But uh, we're in the middle of March and we're going to take a little walk through the orchard, look at some of the trees. And what I want to do is explain how apple grafting works a little bit at a conceptual level. Look at some of these lovely apple trees and explain how I know that they're ready for grafting. Let's go and have a look. Before we look to see how to check that a tree is ready for grafting, I want to spend just a few moments and cover some tree anatomy. And I'd like to sort of use my knife here as a pointer. This is an area where a branch was removed in pruning. In the centre, where that black dot is and the surrounding wood, that's known as the heartwood. And the heartwood is the solid, almost dead, part of a tree that acts as the skeleton. It's the support structure of a tree. And the outside, this darker brown layer, that of course is the bark. And I'd like you to think of that as the skin of the tree. Now, if we look very carefully, and I'm pointing here, can you see the sort of mid-brown thin circle that sits between the heartwood and the bark. That's the cambium layer. And inside the cambium layer are the vessels that transport water and nutrients and products created by photosynthesis around the tree. So the cambium layer is the circulatory system of a tree. It's very thin and exists just under the bark. In order for a graft to work, the two cambium layers of the soil, the growing piece, and the rootstock must touch. They have to fuse together to form a single circulatory system, or water and nutrients cannot move around the tree. So that's going to become very important when I show you the actual grafting technique. But while I'm here, it's useful to understand those three parts of a tree. Right, let's go and look at how to tell that a tree is ready for grafting. Right, there are two types of apple tree and they bear the fruit in different places. There are those called spur bearers and they grow their apples, their fruit, on these little side spurs that stick out. There is another variety called tip bearers that grow their fruit at the end of the branches and we'll look at those in a moment. But this is a spur bearer. This is the sunset apple tree. And I'd like you to notice that that bud is just beginning to open. And that's a good sign that in a very literal sense the sap is flowing in this tree. Apple trees and other fruit trees in winter enter almost a sort of hibernation dormant state and at that point it's quite difficult for a graft to take because if things aren't moving around in the tree it's extremely difficult almost imagine that if you were trying to get uh, a cut to clot well you need your blood to be flowing don't you and that's what we're almost talking about here so when you want to do the particular types of graft we're talking about, check that your tree is entering its vigorous movement time. And obviously in spring when it has to build new leaves and begin to blossom and begin to produce fruit, it's at its most vigorous. Everything's moving around in the tree and it's sucking up nutrients and moisture, etc. And that's the ideal time to create a graft. So that's how to tell on a spur bearer that it's ready for grafting, let's go and have a quick look at a tip bearer. So we're now looking at a tip bearing tree. I won't dwell on this too long because the principles are the same but as you can see the buds here are on the tips of the branches but in similar state. They are just starting to open, the tree is waking up and entering its most vigorous time. And that is a great time for grafting.
So, having understood a little bit about tree anatomy and looked at how to tell that a tree is waking up for spring and in a vigorous state, it should become clear that when we do a graft, in order for those two cambium layers to touch, the two pieces of wood, the root stock and the scion, the growing part, must be almost identical in diameter. Now the only way I found to be sure of getting that to work when selecting a scion is to take the rootstock with me. And I've got a rootstock in my hand. And this becomes almost the Goldilocks type approach. So if I look at this here, you can see the particular branch that I'm looking at is too thin to match this rootstock. And if I look at this one, the branch is too thick. But here, that's just right. So we'll take a piece of that branch and that will become the scion that we will graft to this particular rootstock. There's probably people who can do this by eye. But for me, as a relative amateur, I find take the rootstock with you, choose the scion based upon the correct diameter and a nice healthy straight looking branch. So that more or less concludes part two of the video. In part one we looked at why we graft, in part two hopefully we've covered when to graft, how you can tell that the tree is ready for grafting, the basic anatomy, so where the cambium layer is between the heartwood and the bark, and why it's important that the relative diameters of your scion and your rootstock when doing this type of graft really matter, so select an appropriate scion. There are other types of graft that that's less important, in fact not important at all. And if there's interest in this topic, I can cover those other types of graft later. All the rest of it, the, the why do we do it, etc. stays the same. Just there are different techniques to graft uneven sized pieces of wood. And we can cover those at another time. But for now, doing this basic simple graft. Hopefully we've understood what we need to know. And in the next session, we'll cover the actual technique of joining those two pieces of wood. It's a beautiful day out here today. The sun is finally out and the wind has dropped mostly. I apologize for a little bit of wind noise. You have a wonderful day. We'll talk soon.